in excellence is not negotiable, but we've got to realize the fact that excellence is complex, it can exclude, it can marginalize, and so as we drive transformation, we've got to constantly saying, how do we make sure that it's inclusive, that, and, and how do we make sure that our transformation has got integrity? Because the task is not just to bring people into the fold, or to transform, or to make the staff diverse, is to make sure that people who are here also, their being here transforms the space as well. So as you start your conference, I hope you have much deeper conversations on decolonizing or tra uh, transforming uh, the law curriculum, uh, because I think, as I said to you, both professions are important, not only the law, but teaching as well. I wish you everything of the best. Love our university because we love it too. Love our, 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 our province. As you know, we just, we just had an announcement that day zero has been moved to 2020. But that doesn't mean we are safe. So please, if you don't need to flash, don't flash yet. <laughs> and people from Gauteng, uh, in particular, I, just, I don't know how other people elsewhere do, I just see people in Gauteng who wash their hands with taps open, running water, we don't do that here. Please help us so that we can survive uh, day zero whenever it comes, it should never come. Thank you very much and welcome to UCT. so much, uh, Professor Pakeng. Uh, it is always an enormous honor to uh, introduce Justice Dekang Moseneke, even though he requires no introduction. Uh, but for those of you who have not yet read his book or are not groupies, uh, let me just give you some of the highlights. Uh, Justice Masaneke was uh, arrested and imprisoned on Robben Island at the age of 15. Uh, he received his BA and BUS degrees while in prison and subsequently his LLB degree. Uh, in 1978, he established uh, the law firm of Maluleke, Sariti, and Musaneke. Uh, and in 19, 19, 1983, um, he was called to the Pretoria Bar uh, with some difficulty. Uh, Justice Musaneke's application to the Pretoria Bar precipitated the scrapping of the whites-only membership rule um, at the bar. Ten years later, he took silk. In the meantime, he became the deputy president of the Pan-Africanist Congress, of which he had been a member since the age of 14. Uh, he was on the technical committee uh, that wrote the interim constitution. Uh, he was deputy chair of the Independent Electoral Commission uh, that oversaw the elections in 1994. Uh, and after that, he went into uh, business. So he's been in the SOEs as uh, the chairperson of, uh, of Telcom. And uh, in 2002, he went to the Constitutional Court via an acting uh, stintship. In 2005, he became the Deputy Chief Justice, and uh, you will know that he retired in, um, in 2016. And it's really, I think, for many of us in the Academy, after 2016, that we have gotten to know uh, Justice Moseneke as uh, a friend of, um, of, of the Academy, of, 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 the, um, of, of our law schools. Uh, he has been um, generous in lecturing um, at, at, at various of our law schools. He is an honorary professor here at UCT. Um, he has mentored students and staff. Here at UCT, we have um, a fellowship established by um, our dean, Professor Penny Andrews, uh, in the name of uh, Justice Moseneke, and he has been a wonderful mentor to the uh, Moseneke Fellows. Um, and you will know that he donated the proceeds from the Life of um, in, uh, inquiry um, to also supporting uh, law students at, um, at various institutions. Uh, so today, he continues that trend of uh, of generosity uh, by being here with us and engaging with us. Uh, and I'd like you to join me, please, in welcoming him to the podium. VC parking. These chairs are uncomfortable when you have been living for long. <laughs> I've been trying to wind myself out of the, the chair. 
It's a privilege to be at your university. I've known you for many years and I am truly privileged to have you welcome me and Professor Smythe. Thank you ever so much. I am grateful. I often hear these things and I can't identify with them. It's a little like somebody talking about somebody else other than me. Um, let me start. I have like 30 minutes of talking and I'm going to take 15 minutes, 10 minutes of questions and I'm going to disappear. Um, I come often to UCT um, as an honorary professor and I have stood here a good few times I think. Um, but today I do so talking to law teachers. I prepared a little text, and like a good old judge, it always gives you the discipline of staying on the text and, and therefore higher levels of efficiency and intellectual forthrightness. I would hope someone would go get on with it. I owe my presence here to Professor Jackie Nodier, Professor of Private Law at, at this <coughs> esteemed university. Uh, I've since been told that she was a messenger. Where's Jackie? Oh, there you are. And that she was not the real thing, I was told, and that she was actually sent around. I think you said so, Professor Tracy. And that um, I should indeed, and I'm happy to acknowledge the chairperson of the Society of Law Teachers, Professor Buseletso Litete from Junisa. Um, and therefore, I am a, it is a privilege to be the guest of the Society of Law Teachers of Southern Africa. In her invitation, Professor Nodia suggested that I talk about the legal profession and decolonization of knowledge. Later, she added that the option to talk about economic justice and property clause in the Constitution is available to me. I chose to avoid both and rather talk about the law and not the legal profession and the decolonization of knowledge within the context of jurisprudence. And I sidestep the more topical contestations around economic justice and the land question. Both issues are best left to politicians of all ilk as they rev their engines towards national elections in a matter of months, if you had forgotten. I've chosen to talk about decoloniality and the common law. I will argue shortly that the historical induction of the common law was and in some senses continues to be one of the centerpieces of the colonial project. In order to do so, I explain in theoretical terms the intersection between the notions of decoloniality and of jurisprudence. This I do in order to prompt the debate about the way we view the law and how the law may be freed, albeit partly only from his colonial vestiges and indeed indiscretions. My next plank will be to point to the express provisions of our constitution on the place of the common law in our transitional arrangements. At this point of my discussion, I will remind you that it was not a given during the negotiations, but rather an outcome of the negotiations that the common law would survive the demise of formal colonialism and apartheid. Its survival was premised on the proviso that it continued, its continued sway would be but only to the extent of its consistency with the prescripts and values of our constitution, which were meant to be an antithesis of the colonial and apartheid enterprise. Thirdly, I will question whether law teachers, that is yourselves, and the judiciary have displayed a willingness to embrace the constitutional injunction 
that the Constitution is supreme, that all law must remain in force only to the extent of their constitutional consistency, and that the common law ought to be adapted should it diverge from the mainstream value grid hoped for by our Constitution. Fourthly and lastly, I will point to a few examples of the reluctance of the judiciary and the academy to integrate the common law into the new ethos. This reluctance often invites and justifies the criticism of academic and judicial, the criticism as academic and judicial cherry picking. And that in effect amounts to resistance to jurisprudential transformation. More brazenly, it may be said that there is a pushback and a reluctance to locate the common law in its varied facets within the transformative agenda of our national transition. I promise to talk about four points. If you are listening carefully, let me start. A bit of history always helps. In the yet to be published manuscript of my judicial memoir, I reminisce about law teaching in my time on Robben Island. At first year already, I could sense that the course offering was stridently Eurocentric. The starting point for an entry into the LLB degree was a compulsory past in first year courses in Afrikaans, Netherlands 1, Latin 1, and English 1. The neon lights went up and flashing in my little brain. Only those proficient in the chosen foreign languages were to be admitted to law qualifications. The triple language requirement alone was a considerable barrier to entry. I suppose the barricade was deliberate and was thought to make sense. The legal system was imported, so too were the languages one needed to access to study law. I engaged my youthful energy, passed all three languages, and moved on to confront the content courses. The course contents were derived in part from the ancient Roman law edicts, in other, another part from annotations and other writings of Roman Dutch law scholars in the 15th and 16th centuries. In yet another part, the law I studied was drawn from English law in areas not already populated by Roman Dutch law. So the two mainstreams of European law found their way into our country during the different waves of colonial incursion of the Dutch and the English between 1652 and 1902 at the end of the Second Anglo-Boer War, which coming from Pretoria, I prefer to call Tweede Freyts Oorlog. The free-spirited foretrekkers had rightly resisted further British hegemony. But once done, sadly, they wrongly chose to repress and suppress their generous indigenous neighbors, who, after all the travails of the trekkers, as Chief Lucas Mangope once recalled, I quote, we, unlike others, did not fight them. We gave them land. We gave them cattle and we gave them wives. The code ends. That fusion of imported law was called the common law. If you like, it was said to be unwritten law that was meant to be common to all inhabitants, and thus was to run across the length and the breadth of the conquered country. It was deemed to be binding on everyone who find herself on the amalgamated land that later was called the Union of South Africa in 1910. I need to add that the Union stipulated that only people of European descent would be citizens. But the laws of the Union would bind the voteless and indigenous inhabitants nonetheless. This meant an installation of what was called the common law. 
Without more, principles of the common law were taught at law schools, policed by judges. That explains why, in ordinary parlance, the common law was called the judge's law. It was the judges who were required to rule whether any part of the common law was good or bad, whether it was still alive or extinct, whether it was a legitimate target of change or development. Provided judges did not threaten them or undermine legislation of parliament, they had carte blanche on how to manage the common law. All other laws and customs became subservient to the statutes of a sovereign parliament and the common law. But when the common law and legislation appeared to differ, the two had to be read harmoniously in order to of, not to offend the intent of a sovereign parliament. That was how the colonial conquest cookie crumbled. In that setting, indigenous law and any other system of law counted for nothing. Perhaps the most adverse and inhuman impact of the supremacy of the common law was in family law. Marriages of black people were not marriages, unless they were settled according to marriage laws that gave effect to the common law. For that reason, marriages concluded in accordance with the African indigenous law, the Muslim religion, or under the Hindu custom, and other customary or faith-based marriages suffered invalidity in the eyes of the common law with devastating and degrading results. The law attached no value or results to otherwise valid marriages. Parties, and in particular women, were left without dignity and legal protection due to due to marriage couples. In a dispute or the end of the relationship, no enforcement through the courts was permitted. The children of their marriages were deemed illegitimate. On separation or death, the property of the parties was considered unregulated. In short, the hegemony of the common law caused inequality, pain, indignity, and alienation. That was the mainstream of the law I had to muster if I wanted to pass, which I did. The tough battles between the Roman Dutch law and English law were obvious to me as an innocent bystander. The Africana ruling elite, and in particular the law academics and judges, urged for the supremacy of the Roman Dutch law and went to great lengths in their literature and court judgments to oust the leftovers of the colonial imposition of English law, which was tolerated only in commercial law where the common law was inadequate. And yet the law schools and the courts had a blind sport. They never gave a thought, nor did they care that the common law was a colonial imposition on indigenous and other people of the country. They never openly admitted that the common law was not homebred. It was a direct result and an incident of the colonial project. Young as I was then, the obvious historical truth never escaped me. I wrote in a foreword in a recent publication known as Jurisprudence with an African Context. In it, I recall the course of jurisprudence I was offered at UNISA about 45 years ago. Of course, you will know, being law teachers, jurisprudence is a handy window into the philosophy or the theory of law. It is the outcome of systematic questions posed by legal thinkers and jurists about what the law is and ought to be, about its underlying purpose, and doctrine about legal systems, about legal reasoning, and the adjudication function. In the foreword, I remarked that the offering of jurisprudence unashamedly privileged theories of law that emanated from the global north, starting with Plato, immediately followed by Aristotle, 
and then Thomas Aquinas and his ruminations over eternal law, divine law, and natural law. To pass the postgraduate law degree, one had to display a reasonable mastery of the legal positivism in its historical variants, starting with Thomas Hobbes' social contract and later annotated by John Locke. One had to contend with John Austin's early formulation of legal positivism and in its later versions through the prism of utilitarianism of Jeremy Bentham and the command theory of H.L. Hart and his emphatic rejection of the necessary connection between law and morality. Law students had to grapple with legal realism as propounded principally by American realists like Oliver Wendell Holmes, Jr., Jerome Franklin, and Roscoe Pound. At the time, law schools could not escape, as I said earlier, the continued competition for higher place between English law and Roman Dutch law, perhaps a relic of the Anglo-Boer colonial contestation. For us, students of jurisprudence, this meant a compulsory study of continental thinkers, like Immanuel Kant, who taught the doctrine of a state based upon the law, a Rechtsstaat. In Kantian terms, a regime can be judged by no other criteria, nor be assigned any other functions than those proper to the lawful order as such. For much the same reason, we are compelled to study Hans Kelsen, the pure theory of law, include the hierarchy of norms that owed their blind bindingness to the basic norm, or if you will, the grund norm of the state or nation. In that setting, as should be expected, African indigenous law, customary law, and the underlying notions of personhood, Ubuntu, and kingship, and the related communitarian value system did not feature in the jurisprudence offering. It was an optional course which was taught as an adjunct to a course known as native administration. Indigenous laws underlying normative scheme or claim to the status of law were irrelevant and at best unimportant. Indigenous law was not the law of the land. Its force did not run across the length and breadth of the country, nor did it bind all citizens. It applied validly and only at the election of the parties or litigants with the right to opt out. In time, indigenous law was open code, qualified, close code. It utterfied, virtually succumbed until it was partially resuscitated by the democratic constitution. And that constitutional space allowed judges, as you know, particularly in the constitutional court, to write about the place of Ubuntu and the seminal bedrock of indigenous social organization. Thus, the clamor for revisiting the underpinnings and usefulness of the common law is fueled by a history which I've just narrated that says that the grand theories of law and society, of law, society, and justice that sprung from the global north did nothing to shield the global south from the abiding injustice and scorn of coloniality. Together with his social constructs, his theories, his practices, his hierarchies, and indeed violence. So, what is decolonization or coloniality? Walter McNaulo, a very expansive thinker from Latin America, writes in a work called The Darker Side of Western Modernity, Global Futures, Decolonial Options. He reminds us that decoloniality is synonymous with decolonial thinking and doing. And it questions or problematizes the history of power emerging from Europe. These histories underlie the logic of none other than Western civilization, and therefore coloniality and modernity. This makes the coloniality both a political and epistemic project, a form of epistemic or philosophical disobedience, 
make in the law adds that decoloniality is in effect a continuing confrontation of and delinking from Eurocentrism. Ironic as it may seem, one cannot mount a proper or fruitful philosophical delinking without at a bare minimum engaging critically with the primary texts of legal theorists from the global north. One cannot formulate a far-reaching, decolonizing and liberating philosophy of law without appreciating the essential theoretical divergences from Eurocentrism and in turn repurposing the theory of law to fit decolonized notions of power, society and justice. That intellectual weightlifting to craft a progressive theory of legal knowledge must surely start with an insight into the work of preceding law philosophers, whatever their ilk or breed. And therefore, decolonization does not call for an ignorance on all of the thinkers around the world on issues of law, state, and society. If they were to be studied, delinking would be much easier and possible. And therefore, ladies and gentlemen, plainly, we must in earnest engage with the ever-growing discourse around a delinked or decolonized notion of power, justice, and society in a present-day African setting. The inquiry into the philosophical underpinning of a just and progressive post-colonial society remains vital because first, most features of coloniality persist in post-colonial societies, as we can see and observe in our own country. And second, post-colonial ruling elite have dismally failed to ensure the alteration of material conditions of their citizens in their so-called free democracies. The power relations with the post-colonial state have altered only marginally, and lots of work has therefore to be done. We have to throw the despots out and continue to rethink a post-colonial society that is truly open, just, and deserving towards us. Third, modern African constitutional democracies have opened valuable philosophical spaces to forge new frontiers better suited to the present generational mission. And I see all these young lecturers who are here and professors, this is your time, that is your mission, to rethink and reconfigure our notions of jurisprudence and our notions of the law and its purpose. Therefore, jurists and other scholars and activists must continue to put out critical indigenous thought on truly decolonized and more just legal orders and social constructs in Africa. Even in the face of faltering regime, and there are many on the African continent, we must continue to initiate students of law to hard philosophical questions about the purpose of law and whether it produces just and useful outcomes. This brings me to the last but one point before I stop. But then what happened at the onset of a democratic transition? With colonization, with the induction of a common law. I've pointed out some of the difficulties that it brought into being. Comes 1994. What happened? And this is what happened. When negotiations were embraced, the notion that the common law would continue to operate is one that was highly contested. And many of you are very young to know and realize that. But two vital provisions were inserted in the Constitution in this regard. The first of these was Section 39.2 of the Constitution. And it provides that when developing the common law, every court, tribunal, or forum must promote the spirit, purport, and objects of the Bill of Rights. So suddenly a framework was put around the common law. It was not a free-ranging agent with its colonial origins. 
it had to be developed and within a particular framework, and that framework is one that promotes the spirit, purpose, and objects of the Bill of Rights. Some that did not pre-exist, that did not exist before 1994. And the second provision, equally important, provides that the Bill of Rights does not deny the existence of any other rights and freedoms that are recognized or conferred by the common law, customary law, legislation, and the provision goes to the extent that they are consistent with the bill. The injunction is fairly plain. It means preserve the good and dump the bad. As Johann Krechler, my esteemed colleague at the Constitutional Court, put it, we had to separate the good from the bad. That was our duty. And that's the duty of every academic and the duty of every judge in this country. Or in the words of the esteemed Ishmael Mohammed, we had to shut the Doe family on a shameful past and preserve of it only that which is useful and nothing else. And to wrap up therefore, it is quite clear that you have a common law, which is a construct of coloniality, that survives the transition, only provided it comports with the values of a new society, which is the antithesis and the opposite of what apartheid and coloniality was. The last point before I conclude is that there has been reluctance to embrace this brave new world that the Constitution puts in place. Many professors have walked into their lecture halls and continued like the Constitution was never enacted. And they sought to draw all the inspiration from Foote and van der Kessel and van der Linde. And let me pause to remind you, and you are young, I'm happy to say this. When Roman Dutch law was developed, it was during the feudal times. It was unfettered power of the lords and ladies of the feudal system with unqualified ownership, not only of their land, of those who worked on their lands. And it was in that context that what we often vaunt as the common law and Roman Dutch law was developed, and so too the English law. So the minute we identify and understand that these are constructs which develop within an oppressive regime, it will free our own minds to try and relocate valuable common law in many parts into where it is as a useful, useful part of our transition to a better society. Now you know that that reluctance has attracted criticism as a form of fifth column within the academy, within some or all of the law schools, and in some courts. And I want to suggest that it is highly dangerous to go on cherry-picking what is suitably the Constitution, what you like, and leave out what you don't like and hung, hang on to the past in an unhelpful, unhelpful way. Few prominent examples. The Constitutional Court in Administrative Law here a case, the pharmaceutical. The argument before it was that there are two systems of administrative law. The one was the one premised on the common law, another premised on the Constitution. And Chaskelson P., who was head of the court, pronounces very vehemently, there is one law in this land, only one law, not two laws. There's one administrative law and not two administrative laws. One under the common law and one under the Constitution. The Constitution is an overarching supreme document from which all administrative law must flow. And that was put to rest. And that followed a judgment of Mfungo of the Constitutional Court in which Kentridge A.J. wrote that before you reach constitutional law, you must first try and resolve the matter under the common law. There are cases when that approach is quite convenient, but that's hardly the law in its absolute form. 
when a dispute attracts resolution within the norms that the Constitution require, the injunction is quite clear. The common law, the private law, has to give way to those new values. I'll give you examples in a moment as I move on. And the various examples of the law of contract, in a paper that I published, delivered to Stellenbosch, I spent a lot of time to show how the SCA missed a number of opportunities to develop the common law, consonant with the new values that sit in our constitution. The failure to do so is a matter that clearly is resistive of the transformative design of our constitution, and it ought not, ought not to happen. And remarks of that kind you'll also find in judgments like Everfresh. Um, those of you who do contract law, you'll remember that. And the last thing I want to say before I sit, it's law of delict. Again, a relic of feudal law. Let me explain. It's all being unfair to the law of delict. There are many parts which are available, and there are many parts which are, in Pretoria we call them older vets, old and tired. As demonstrated very quickly, the law of delict is premised on the principle of restitution. If there is conduct or omission, which is unlawful and negligent, which lead to harm, the victim or the claimant would be entitled to recompense, provided the victim can demonstrate patrimonial loss. If you're riding on a high horse and you are some lord somewhere up in the global north and you trample over a child who has no earnings, and the child dies. Roman Dutch law teaches that there are no legal consequences <coughs> because the child cannot demonstrate patrimonial loss. So it's a system driven by patrimony. Let's take it a little further. If you're an actuary and you're in a, in a taxi, with somebody from Nyanga who has never been to school and doesn't work, you both become paraplegic, the actuary will be paid for the balance of his or her working life. Annualized, say over 30 years, 40 years, depending on their age. And the person in the same taxi with the same injuries will receive nothing. It's a current provision of our law of delict. You must demonstrate Patrimony, patrimonial laws. <clears throat> and at this time, it was very valuable because the poor could never come back onto the well of and claim anything from them. Their harm and their loss would amount to nothing, would be inconsequential to the law. So if a little child drowns in a toilet pit and dies, the law is agnostic about that. It is an irrelevant occurrence under law of delict as it is now. In other words, it's not a concern of the law because he, she can demonstrate patrimonial loss. The richer, the better, and the more you get. The poorer, tough luck, nothing you get. Let's go further. Under the law of delict, if you sit in a wheelchair in life as a demand, and you have never worked because of mental impairment, then harm is caused to you. Maybe you die, maybe you don't. The normal principles of law of delict, you get zilch.
in the face of a constitution that tells you that achievement of equality is vital, that tells you that human dignity is central to our enterprise to change society, that tells you that you have access, a right of access to proper health care, that tells you that public officials owe you a duty of proper governance following the principles set out in the Constitution. That tells you, by and large, that you're entitled to be a good citizen, treated well, and have access to public goods in a fair and equitable manner. That's what the Constitution requires. And the common law says, if you're dead, sorry, tough luck, goodbye. And I'm doing this and exaggerating the situation in order to be able to bring home to you, I hope, the duty that you bear. There are no special tough lines. Law teaches or to embrace firstly the change that happened in 1994, two, that the context within which customary, it's not only the common law, customary law that demeans and purpose to treat people were struck down consistently at the Constitutional Court. Bear. Women may not inherit from their fathers. They've struck that down. Women may not become community leaders in tribal setting. We've struck that law down. Common law is no different. Private law, all other law, contract law, no different. We have to infuse the values of reasonableness even in the face of pacta sunt servanda. So my invitation to you is just interesting, it was nice to have had and inherited all these laws. As I conclude, they are a colonial construct. We've received them in circumstances of conquest and let's not pretend that it's all innocent, perfect law. And when you go and examine the law quite carefully, it has features which are not consonant with the current project to arrange in our society. And lastly, you'll probably say to me, but the politicians are messing up, but they are stealing, but they are young, sure. And they are doing the wrong thing, sure. That's precisely why we have to emphasize the role of the law as concerned about just outcomes. That's why you have to go out there and teach young people the very vital role of pushing back on evil and permitting goodness to prevail. That's the ultimate purpose of law, aside of all the refinery and all the stringent rules. At the end of the day, it's whether law can produce just outcome between women and women, between men and men. And that is its only true purpose. And you can't do so when, in fact, law consciously continues to aggravate, to aggravate inequality. I hope that was useful to you. It must have been a rough ride for some, but that is who we are. That's our history, worse and all. And we can make a difference as law teachers. Acknowledge that past and undertake the duty to make our law to serve us in a useful way. And the common law can be put to that use very valuably. Thank you for listening and God bless. we have clearly been challenged. Um, so thank you so much for those very, um, very inspiring and, and challenging um, words. I think we have to really look at, look at the way we look at, at law and that lens uh, through which we look at law. So, so thank you so much uh, for that. I think we've got some time for questions. I don't know if they are, if you're happy to take a few questions. Okay. Any questions? Yeah, maybe yeah. 
ಅನಿಸುತ್ತೆ Well, I've got two questions. I think let me answer them quickly. Um, firstly, one, general articles. I think the quality of general articles in our country is very high. Um, the question is, does, do the articles engage our law teachers helpful? You've heard my address. Some are, some are not. And, and I don't find it overly complicated, frankly. Um, Every time you have to confront, let's say a case note, it will relate to the human condition. All disputes are located that way. Or at a theoretical level, maybe it's a jurisprudential piece. I think some law schools do it more than others. Some academics do it more than others. Some believe the only thing that matters is to them say the common law as understood from the 16th century. And others understand just because of passage of time, forget a bit about 1994, that we have to continue to adapt and to make useful law. The human construct that must be purposed to achieve outcomes that I've talked about. So yes, some of the journals are, are very useful and quite thoughtful and well researched and it is your duty to continue to make the points that I've been trying to make today. To make sure that law is not static in our country. Um, the second point about, I think, let me talk a little about the constitution. <laughs> When you decide to take a trip to Tata and you take a vehicle let me leave that example for a moment. I think I'm going to take a lot of time unnecessarily. There's a difference between what any government and politicians do and what the constitution requires. Thank you. 
a little bit, bit of a difference between the Quran and what human beings do, Holy Quran, or difference between what the Bible says and what people do. You don't take the Bible and put it up in smoke, at least if you've got a believer of, of that particular religion. My position quite consistently has been the Constitution is not perfect. Hell knows, had we done most of the things in that Constitution, the way we ought to have done, would have changed so much of the society. It's an easy, convenient diversion to say the Constitution is bad. <coughs> You're not telling me if it was better whether those who had implemented would have done better. You can't say the Constitution is bad about access to health care, can you? But we know the money that ought to be used to access health care or education gets, goes to all sorts of places, disappeared all sorts of places. So, so let's, we should be careful not to look for easy way out. You heard in my paper I talk about post colonial African states who are not doing their work. So we have to also assume that responsibility. And you as law teachers, as the courts have done, we've consistently said the law has not been followed. So we must be careful not to find very easy, ready excuses. And the Constitution, I agree, doesn't talk in many words, but it says that we recognize the injustice of the past. And, and, and we could, there could be more detail. I decry gender violence. You could put it other ways. You could say, yes, they beat their wives in the morning and in the evenings, and they, then we can put a lot of detail. But essentially, it's a statement that you resist gender inhumanity and violence. So the Constitution acknowledges that our past was uneven, unequal, and unjust, and that it is put in place to remedy and replace that with another system. In all fairness, I think we should, we should credit that way. And not lightly, of course, the Constitution must be changed and will be changed when the moment so requires. I think not lightly. I think we have to do as much as we can to achieve most of its objectives without saying whether or not it was a good pact. Yes, I was one of the people who, who wrote the interim constitution. I didn't negotiate it, but I was one of the technical craftspeople, one of the eight people who actually wrote it um, once the political deals had been made. One question there. Um, 
that is my question.
to his servant, access to help, to his kids, access to housing. Those are things that give me a way as a life. She doesn't have justice and she didn't have justice. No steps should be taken. We ought to think them through carefully, systematically, collectively, and come to the And you know the writings of the Constitutional Court, which are taught about its place and the difficulties of, of its history. And how we ought to continue to apply those parts. But we ought to discard those that are bad. Do they discriminate against women? There's no good law. Thank you. I think you've given us the challenge, um, Justice Masaneke, as, as law teachers, 
um, both in terms of just our general teaching, but also in terms of how we proceed in terms of the, the, the conference. Um, so, so thank you once again. Um, I just want to get to some, the, uh, some announcements and some house rules um, as we proceed. Our, our first panel is to start at, at 2 o'clock. Um, so just before we start, just to say thank you to our, our sponsors, um, UCT Law at Work, um, who helped organize, and of course to tutors, um, LexisNexis, and Oxford University Press, um, just for, uh, for, sp for sponsoring um, all the little things that you have um, kind of with you. Um, the other thing, just to we, uh, just remind you of that, if you do have a paper, um, there is a book project that's coming out of this conference, and we'll talk about the details of it a little bit later, but just kind of bear that in, that in mind, um, that there's a, a book project um, that, that we're looking at. Okay? So that would be something uh, to, to work towards. And then talking just about um, your presentations, um, if you will just check, uh, the, there may be some you know, changes not to the panels, but to just uh, um, some of the, uh, the uh, m members of your panels. If you can just have a look, the notices will be up outside the, the doors of the lecture theatres um, and then on the various uh, um, notice boards outside. So please just have, a, have a, a look at that. And then, of course, have a look at the, uh, um, the electronic means. We've got a, law, uh, a website and then Twitter is the other thing just to, just to have a look at. Um, we will be recording um, your presentations, and the reason for the recording is because we, uh, we have to give you prizes. Yeah? Um, and we hopefully will be able to you know, give the prizes after the event, because the gala dinner takes place before, um, before the final papers. Um, so we're going to be recording all of you, and you'll need to just sign a, a consent form. And so you'll be notified of, the, uh, of, the, um, of your prizes. The one is for the best uh, presenter in legal education, and then the other prize is, of course, for the uh, first-time presenter. Um, and then if you could just tell your panelist, your, sorry, your uh, chair, if you are a first-time presenter, and if you want to be um, uh, considered for that particular prize. So when you do that, just please let your, let your chair um, know. Um, other thing just to remind you of, I've just got a list of things here. Um, the uh, gala dinner tomorrow night, there's a bus that will be taking you to the event. Um, the bus leaves UCT at quarter past six. If you can please, if you haven't notified um, the, the ladies outside um, as to whether you're going to need the bus, um, just please let, let them know um, so that we can have you know, a bus for you. And then just the last thing uh, before we get going for the next uh, um, the panels, um, the, if you can tweet um, as much as you can um, about, about the law teachers, the Twitter handles and stuff, I think that's what they call it, or outside the buildings. Apparently there are going to be uh, prizes that tutors will be announcing every day on Twitter uh, for the best tweets and for the best photos. Okay? So there's another, another challenge. Um, so if you, you'd have to get up on Twitter so that you can just have a look to see whether you've won a prize for your tweet and for your photo. Okay, so if you could just also just go to your...